The Forum at 8 with Polani Gwala. It is now nine minutes after eight. A very good morning indeed and a warm welcome to the Forum at 8 here on SAFM, South Africa's news and information leader. Well, over the weekend, the Democratic Alliance held its fifth federal elective congress in Boxburg, in Boxburg and Eguruleni um, here in Gauteng. Uh, a lot happened there. A lot of discussions were held and, of course, um, elections as well for new leadership and so on. And uh, to help us talk about some of the matters that came through from that congress, let me just uh, go straight to Parliament and welcome our guests on the program this morning, Dr. Wilmot James. He is the chair of the DA Federal Council. Dr. James, thank you very much for your time this morning. Yes, good morning and good morning to the listeners. Ah, thank you. Thanks indeed for your time. Here with me in our studios in Johannesburg, Ralph Matecha. He's a political analyst. Good morning to you, Ralph. Good morning, Kalani, and good, good morning to, to listeners. Thank you very much. Thanks indeed for your time. Now, before I go to Dr. James and really talk about what happened over the weekend, our parliamentary correspondent, Mercedes Percent, spoke to people in the Western Cape in particular, or in Cape Town in particular, I beg your pardon, who expressed their feelings about the DA's uh, Fifth Federal Council uh, Congress, but also just spoke about what they are expecting from the party going forward. This is what she found out. Some of those who were interviewed on the streets of Cape Town had views ranging from expecting nothing to the DA running the province well, while one European foreign national is more concerned about the relationship between the DA and the ANC, which he says does not reflect well internationally. Don't really have expectations for them. Why not? They do nothing for us, so why must I have expectations? But there's still a lot to be done, and I guess patience is a virtue. They're running the Western Cape fantastically, and there's nothing they can improve. They must just carry on. Well, as a person from from outside of South Africa, it just seems on the news you hear there's a lot of sort of conflict between the ANC and the DA, and it seems as though there's a lot of political maneuvering to try and make the other seem or look bad rather than trying to work together to improve the country. So I think the DA should really try and take a, a step towards working more with the ANC rather than just trying to make them look bad for political you know, maneuvering purposes. You think they can work together? I think they have to. Now that power has been reinstalled in DA leader Helen Ziller, who is also Western Cape Premier, her muscle to change the Western Cape Cabinet to ensure gender representation still remains a bone of contention. Two political analysts have different views about Zilla's provincial cabinet composition. A Western Cape-based political analyst, Waid Patel, thinks it's based on performance. The DA's ideology and premise is that people are elected into positions of leadership on the basis of capability, merit and credentials. Um, so I don't think it's going to be an issue that's going to result in changes in the Western Cape Cabinet. And if it does, I think whatever changes, and I don't think there will be, if there are, they may be very small, will be based on the premise that these changes are being ushered in because we want to further strengthen the capability of the cabinet in the Western Cape. Another political analyst from the University of the Free State, Dr. Situle Romatebesi, says the lack of gender representation in the DA-led male-dominated cabinet could lead to questioning the party's stance on the constitutional principles of non-sexism. Uh, the premier of uh, any province does have the power to elect anybody to cabinet she had that power in the first place because those people did not nominate themselves but i cannot foresee a situation where perhaps uh, the da will be against at least at a very you know a, a gradually introduce women leaders within the cabinet because if we look at the current situation the da is definitely not living up to uh, the constitutional principle of non-sexism and also of a transforming society into a better place for all the women in our country. But Zilla always maintains that a party has taken strides to empower female leaders in critical positions at a national, provincial and local level. She refers to Lindwe Masibuko as DA parliamentary leader at a national level, herself as premier at a provincial level, and Cape Town Mayor Patricia Delil at a local level. Mercedes Besant, SABC News, Parliament. Let's go again then to Parliament there in Cape Town. Dr. James, again, congratulations on your re-election. 
Thank you very much. Indeed, thank you very much for, for coming through again. Uh, you know, I would like to pick up on, on what the, the foreigner was saying in that clip that we just played now about the conflict between the DA and the ANC. And it's quite interesting because even people here at home have suggested, analysts in particular, that the DA needs to state clearly, clearly what it stands for as opposed to just opposing the ANC. Do you think there's a point to be made about that, about what the DA stands for as opposed to, as opposed to just over and over again opposing what the ANC is doing? Um, could I first of all say that I'm a federal chairperson of the DA and not of the, of the council? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay, the chairman of, the, of our council is uh, Mr. James Self. Yeah. Well, what we've done over the last year is, in fact, go to South Africans with an offer um, because we do believe that we have now matured to becoming a party in government and therefore we need to make an offer to the voters that defines who we are and what we stand for in contrast to being an anti-ANC party. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there are times when we want to be opposed to the ANC on the basis of policy measures but we certainly don't see ourselves as a general anti-ANC party. So, and the offer is the following. Um, in the first place, we produced a growth and jobs plan that we released at the end of July, and we presented to the voters our economic policies. Mm -hmm. And the, the philosophy behind our economic policies essentially is that we believe in a market-oriented um, economy. Clearly, there's a role for government in that to create create a conducive environment um, but it's essentially a market a market oriented economy sure. and our principal concern is about jobs South Africans as you know given our unemployment rate and so on so we offer a strategy and a plan for how we will create jobs how we would Im improve education in order to get jobs uh, growth going and uh, as a general approach, we say that what we need to do is grow our economy in the longer term at 8%. So that's the one offer. Mm. Uh, and then the other offer um, in philosophical terms, firstly, is a very strong belief in the rule of law and judicial independence. Secondly, I've already mentioned the market-oriented um, economy. Thirdly, a commitment to redress, especially with regards to land and housing. Uh, in urban areas and rural areas and reconciliation um, mm. because we we really need to have real reconciliation policies put in place, not simply street renaming, but mm. much deeper. And finally, I believe in having an independent and professional civil service that can deliver services to people. Sure, maybe exactly that's that's where the problem is uh, when it comes to the DA because all of these things that you've just uh, given us now, the ANC can all can claim all of them actually, can say, well, that's exactly what we're offering. And therefore, it makes it difficult for the DA to distinguish itself from the ANC other than by coming across as effectively anti-ANC. Well, I disagree. I mean, uh, our commitment to a market based economy is not the same as ANC. The ANC believes in state capitalism and um, it's a very different approach. They but believe isn't in that a new discussion really within the ANC, the, 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 the involvement of the state? That's a pretty new discussion that's just happened over the past months. But generally, if you look at what has happened over the past 15, 16 years, market economy. No, that's not true. I mean, it's a fairly clear blue waters um, between how the ANC approaches the role of government in the economy and our approach to the role of government in the economy and how it is you want to release energy. So that's quite different. Mm -hmm. When it comes to redress and reconciliation, the ANC you know, approaches those two things in a similar way philosophically, but in terms of its practice, it hasn't done very much. Uh, a lot was done in the 90s uh, with President Mandela's administration, certainly, but since then very little has been done in practice. Cater deployment is completely um, in principle and in practice, fundamentally different to saying that a civil service must be independent and it must be professional. Mm -hmm. What the ANC has done is placed all of its people, regardless of competence, in most cases, um, in certain areas, um, in the civil service and has compromised the effectiveness of the civil service. And because you do that, potholes start appearing. So. Um, and that's a very different approach to our approach. 
All right. And you're going to hear people from the Western Cape who say that when, when the DA took over the Western Cape, they, they uh, employed their own people in certain strategic positions. No, they, what, they, were, they were political appointments in certain offices um, at, um, at fairly high levels on the basis of competence, certainly. Um, but where people agreed with the overall direction of the party, but, but, the, but nothing Dr. beyond James, that. The argument is going to be when the NC does it, it's not professional, but when the DA does it, it's professional. Yeah, partly that's true, but the ANC goes much deeper than that. We, do, we don't have cadre deployment. What we do is, in, one can look at very specific examples, but there are uh, individuals appointed on the basis of competence in limited areas so that there is some kind of policy coordination. Hmm. Let me go back to some of the discussions, and I'm going to bring you in, Ralph, in a minute. Some of the discussions that took place at the Congress itself, if I may, Dr. James, uh, starting with the issue that was raised by Masizole uh, Masela, the issue of the deputy to Helen Zilla. Is, is, is that issue completely off the table, and is there a reason why it's completely off the table? Well, the issues off the table in terms of um, being able to have a Congress resolution on it because clearly it's a Congress decision, and the next time we can decide these things would be in three years' time. It's possible to do it in between uh, at a federal council level. But the reason why um, we believe um, it is not a good idea is that our existing positions can involve much more work. Um, my own position should be raised up to a much higher level of work, and my city deputies, for example, mm -hmm. um, I can imagine that we can work much harder um, because as, as the party grows, there is a room for more work. It's a belief that you don't create a position of deputy leader when it has no content. Well, let's talk a little bit about the image, though, that people may have. And it's been said out there that perhaps the fact that there's only Helen and she's the leader of the party makes it look like a one-woman party. Well, you only have one leader, you know. And so... Um, Parties with two leaders just don't work. Mm. So you have a single leader and you have unity of purpose around that leader. Mm. But then leadership itself uh, cascades through the entire party. Um, there's uh, myself uh, as federal chairperson. There's three deputy leaders. There's James Self as, um, as uh, chairperson of the federal council. Then you have nine provincial leaders, you know, so it's one per province. And then you have leaders at a local government level. So there is a growing uh, number of and constant expansion of leadership capacity. And then we have a young leaders program and we have a system of grooming younger people into positions. Mm. Um, and so I believe that as the party grows, which it is presently, we need to expand our leadership. Mm. But on the basis of real work, you know, you, you see it growing organically. You can see where the need is. You define the job. Right. And then you advertise and, and you fill that job. Okay. Let me, let me bring in Ralph. Uh, a number of issues have come through. The issue of leadership uh, within the DA and um, the issue of what it offers uh, South Africans perhaps as an alternative to the ANC. What are your thoughts on those matters? You know, Colin, when I look at, the, <clears throat> at what the DA offers, it is very difficult to establish what is so distinct about the DA as a political party compared to the ANC, or maybe even compared to other opposition parties in South Africa. And I think that the success that the DA has had in the past few years uh, receiving what you could say disgruntled voters from the ANC, even if that number is still on the margins, has given the party an illusion that uh, it offers something very distinct, that uh, some kind of a political identity that people could want to identify with. When I look at this party, I think the best that the DA has come up with, I think, uh, the way in which it has packaged itself, it continues to package itself as a technically competent political party, some kind of a company, a SWAT team that you bring in where there is a problem in local government, a SWAT team that you bring in where there is a problem of lapse when it comes to accountability in government. And as you correctly stated, those things that the DA talks about, such as the upholding the rule of law, upholding the constitution, those are things that each and every 
people in South Africa can believe in. And also the ANC and other opposition parties, they believe in the same vision. The only problem is that the ANC cannot live up to that to some extent. There's been criticism that the party has challenges when it comes to living up to accountability and all that. But so, you, you, so you talk about the SWAT team when there are problems at local government and so on. Isn't that what South Africans want now, given some of the problems that we report about day in and day out in terms of governance? At this point, it, it, it will certainly drive a certain amount of voters to the DA. But the question that I often ask myself is that, is it sustainable? Has the DA been able to uh, package itself as a political home? Because the way in which it has been gaining voters from uh, other political, from the ANC, for example, it's I wouldn't. I would not actually say it has been gaining. I would say the NC has been losing voters. The NC has been getting out of its way through the problems that they are having in local government, losing voters, and the DA has been accepting those voters. I cannot point to an instance where I could say the DA has launched a political campaign that you would say will lure voters who are almost comfortable in another party, where voters will think that it looks like we've got a better deal on the uh, 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 on the DA side. I but cannot, why? But why I is cannot, it that in your view the not, DA is, is unable to come up with that strategy? And I'm going to ask Dr. James it, to respond. Because it requires a vision. It requires something beyond the technicalities. While the party gains now... Uh, through the question of technicalities and the malfunction at local government. The situation just favors the party now. But the party will soon reach a ceiling in a sense that this movement and also other political parties are taking a hit as to how the DA is gaining. So, and so also, you're suggesting that it doesn't have a vision, and even though it has elected the kind of leaders that it did over the weekend, including uh, the three deputies to Dr. James? The situation that is confronted with on the ground has driven the party to be more lax. They are confusing the technicalities of running government with vision. And also the question of other other opposition parties. The reason why you have the DA continuing to receive, you could say, a significant number of disgruntled voters from the ANC is because other opposition parties, opposition parties such as COPA, are not strong. And right. actually, I believe that the greatest threat to DA's growth is not necessarily uh, the ANC maybe becoming much stronger. The greatest threat is the opposition parties. The right. DA has not competed for the vote across the opposition right. parties. Just a, a quick response for me, Dr. James, if you may, because I really would like also just to talk about this realignment of opposition uh, politics? Well, let me just say two things. You Mm -hmm. know, it's not technicalities when you speak about the quality of um, delivery because we, I mean, um, my colleague is is right in saying that we package ourselves as a party that can deliver. And that's a very important thing because uh, delivery of, of quality services to people is fundamental to the existence. But it's not, the technical competence is there and he's quite right to point that out. Mm-hmm. But it's about governance. It's about how you govern uh, on a local level, provincial level, and then obviously at a national level. That makes the difference. Not simply the technicalities of governance, but mm. the manner of governance in terms of the levels of accountability, the levels of uh, financial accountability, the ability to get clean audits, the ability to take decisions and implement them and so on and so forth. So it has to do with governance. And we believe that we are much better at governing than the ANC is. Hmm. So that's the one point I wanted to make. Um, Not to trivialize this question of governance and delivery. All right. So you think think that's the overarching vision that the DA is offering the South African electorate? That's where we started. Mm -hmm. And we demonstrated that we can do that in government. It's not just pie in the sky stuff. Okay. We can do that. But there are other things that we are... Sure. Embraced. Uh, Dr. James, let me ask you to hold the second point. I need to take a commercial break quickly. There's also Rebecca in Cape Town, Brian in Germiston, Mike in Middleburg, and a whole lot of SMSs coming through. Let me take a break. The Forum at 8 with Kolani Gwala. Let me just quickly hear from Brian in Germiston first before I come back to Dr. James. Uh, Brian, good morning. Hi, hello. Good morning, Kolani oh, and your guests. Hi, welcome. Um, I just wanted to find out if uh, Dr. James is aware, and if he is not, what is he saying about the fact when he talks about cater deployment. I happen to know that in the Western Cape, after the elections, the DA removed six municipal managers who achieved um, unqualified audits in their municipalities and um, and replaced them with DA loyalists. Hmm. All right, Brian, thank you very much. those municipalities if need be. All right, Brian and Jemiston, thank you very much. Because the point being made here, Dr. James, is that political parties do this. They, they, they put in their own loyalists, including the DA. Well, what we have done is say that uh, the quality of service delivery at the municipal level requires a competent 
independent and committed set of well-qualified people to run it, and that turns a municipality around. But what's also required is some level of policy coordination, and so appointments have been made in order to make sure that our policies are actually implemented. It's very limited. It's not widespread. We don't create civil service jobs to fill uh, the ranks simply with party loyalists. So I don't agree with that. I think there has been some changes, but these changes are to allow for competence and policy coordination, and I'm quite satisfied with that we've done the right thing. Uh, Rebecca in Cape Town, good morning. Yes. Hi, Hello. Hi. Um, uh, my, my remark might seem trivial considering, you know, there, 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 there's no argument in the, in the fact that Helen Villa and they are comp- competent. In fact, I'm going to refer only to Helen Villa. What I, as a white South African, find quite off-putting about her again being a, a leader is that she is so divisive. She might be hugely efficient, and I'm sure she runs a great party. And I, you know, you, re- you uh, but deeply, she's she's made no inroads. I feel. Oh, not enough inroads into other sectors of, of the population. And there are times that, uh, quite honestly, I mean, efficiency, it, it seems trivial. It's efficiency could be traded off for a little bit of charm. I find her divisive. I find I'm sometimes embarrassed by the fact that she she's so attractive to white people. It, it's, um, she has a, 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 an efficient and, 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 as I said, charmless, sorry, I'm, I'm a bit nervous, no. charmless stance that I, I would have been much happier seeing someone else take over the reins. She would run it maybe on a, on a much quieter level. But her social interactions are difficult. I mean, t- take, for instance, her her argument with um, Simpiwe Dana, which is so infuriatingly immature mm. and, and again divisive. And right. I suppose that really is... All right. Rebecca, thank you very much. I, I think you made your point very clear. I'm going to ask uh, Dr. James to respond to it, but uh, again, let me just open the lines and tell people to give us a call if you have anything to add in this discussion. Remember our numbers, 0891 I'll also be taking SMSs at 34701, 34701. Email me at guala at sabc.co.za. But what, what I'll do at the moment is to take your updates and, and then come back, talk a little bit more about this issue a little later on. The Forum at 8 with Polani Gwala. And Dr. James, I was trying to be careful about this because uh, it's very easy, again, to make a mistake. There's a difference between the chair of the federal, ch- or the, the, the federal chairperson of the DA and the DA federal council chair. Right. Yeah. And, and you are the chairperson of... Uh, you, uh, I'm the, the federal chairperson. Yeah. yeah. It's, what, is, what is the difference? Well, the council is a decision-making body. Mm-hmm. Uh, the highest decision-making body of the DA between its uh, federal congresses. And so it is a governance administrative body and Mm. decision-making body. And James Shelf chairs that body as a body of about 120 people. Mm. So I'm chair of the federal, I'm the federal chair of the DA. And he's the federal council chair. Right. So Um. um, I wanted to get back to an earlier point just very quickly about, Mm. about growth, because that was a very important question asked about where do we get our voters from. And just a very quick point is that there has been organic growth in the population of South Africa. If you look at the census that's just been released and you compare it to the last census. And our great growth is not to necessarily take votes from the ANC, although we are beginning to take votes from the ANC and from other opposition parties. We're certainly taking votes from there as well. But the greatest growth, in fact, is among South Africans that are now beginning to vote for the first time and they were born in the early 90s, um, and they have never belonged to any other party. Mm. And so that's where the biggest pool of voters, in fact, are, and which is why we've expanded our presence at universities and colleges, and we've made a, a deep effort to make sure that we are attractive to what we call the, you know, the born-free generation. Sure. 
Right, a lot of SMSs, by the way. That maybe I should just read one or two, uh, Dr. James, for you. Um, there's Mama who says, Rebecca is 100% correct. DA is lo- losing credibility. It's becoming a militant party. It is reactionary and it is losing its dignity. I'm going to ask Dr. James to respond. But so in Bloemfontein says, does the DA support abortion? Uh, another one from Kululego in Durban says, how old is the DA? Does, it a- uh, does its age translate to its transformation in terms of being representative of the demographics of the country? Uh, another one says, and I, you know, perhaps it picks up on that issue about uh, efficiencies, effectiveness. Uh, it says, um, the question, DA has failed farm workers in the Western Cape, hence the Duoron's crisis, which has exposed the DA. That's according to Sam. But there, there's also a question here, and perhaps please, if you may start with that one for me. It, says, uh, it comes from Zubaydah. Can he comment on the fact that the Auditor General found the top four municipalities in the country to be in KZN? What happens then to Cape Town and municipalities in the Western Cape? What happens to this theory of of efficiency, uh, Dr. James? Well, you've raised lots and lots of questions. Uh, But let me tackle the last one around efficiency. I mean, there are uh, municipalities and cities in the country that are not governed by the DA that do quite well. Uh, you know, so we're not saying that all uh, ANC uh, governed um, um, places and institutions are necessarily bad or uh, lacking in terms of accountability. Mm. But the general pattern tends to be, uh, if you look at provinces, for example, and you look at, you know, accepted performance indices that are constructed by the national government, mm. most ANC places, um, in fact, don't do very, very well. But it's not too... It's not to be anti-ANC, and this is very difficult to govern, you know, and um, and we're not perfect, and we also will make mistakes, mm. and the challenge of government is a, is a, is a very difficult one. So any party, um, no matter what its ideology, would have to really work very hard at doing a good job, and we, we are just doing our very best uh, mm. effort, and sometimes we make an error. Um, l- there was a question about... Um, the fact that we're divisive or we're militant and so yeah, on. Yeah. Look, I mean, I think that it's important to be able to communicate with voters. And it's, be, it's very, very important to communicate with voters on fundamental issues with great clarity. And sometimes that comes across as militant um, because we b- care about things. We care about the rule of law. And when there's interference in the judiciary and when there's political affair and interference where there shouldn't be, we will become very outspoken on that question. Okay. Um, I think that um, uh, leadership has to be decisive, leadership has to be bold, and leadership most of all has to, has to communicate very clearly. And sometimes that communication um, can be uh, quite confrontational and adversarial, and, mm-hmm. and there's the time and place for that. But I agree that what one has to do in the longer term is to develop an, an approach that is embracing. And we, through our redress and our reconciliation policies, want to make sure that the DA is a home for everybody who believes in democracy. All right. But w- what about that question uh, of, of the charm or charmlessness of uh, Helen Ziller? Well, that's a very personal comment, so I will not comment on it. All I would say is that she is a fabulous person to work for. She's, a, she's the one politician that thinks quickly on her feet. For me, she's always thinking ahead. She's always anticipating problems. Mm. And she has a remarkable ability, in fact, to lead this party at this time okay. in the way that she does. So I enjoy working with her. Okay, but perhaps also a message in support then of, of the point you've just made now. Somebody says, well, referring to the caller who finds Ms. Zilla charmless, uh, do you want things done? Charm only benefits one person. Efficiency and ability can help so many more. Uh, do you have a comment, Ralph, on, on whether Ms. Zilla has charm or not? Well, I think she does she has improved on her dancing that one we can be sure you know personally she has been able to try to reconnect with people but uh, there are still people who find her quite aggressive in a political demeanor and the way in which uh, you know she uh, deals with the ANC in particular you know South African voters have got this sense of uh, expecting some level of respect within our political not too much of aggression they expect uh, a little bit of the warmth that they want to see among political leaders you know and I 
don't, I don't think they are getting much of that. But mm. I think uh, uh, just a, a one point I want to make, Golani, mm. is, is the false choice between efficiency and political leadership. And I think this is where the DA is heading into trouble here. There seems to be a choice that you can be efficient and then provide in those municipalities, and that will exonerate you from lack of political leadership and from lack of a vision, to put it that way. And research shows that uh, South African voters do not only require uh, service deliveries. And I'm not saying it's not it's not important, the question of service delivery, but they require over more than service delivery. We have seen in some areas where there are protests, even where service delivery has actually incre- uh, improved. And that shows poor leadership. And where the DA is, even when you look at the Western Cape, they can claim to run the municipalities very well. You look at the books, uh, they, are not, they are not doing very bad when it comes to financial management and governance. But I think they are not being able to rein in communities. They are not being able to strike a rapport with, with communities. They do not have credibility among some of uh, what you can call your black constituencies in the province. And that, for me, is, is the future that they are going to be dealing with. If they are not careful, they are going to be resorted to being managers of municipalities. But at national politics, where vision is required, I think they are far mm-hmm. lacking, and they may not make strides in that. Dr. James, if we can just keep that point about black rapports in, in the back of our minds, we'll come back to it. Let me take one or two calls here. Some in Cape Town. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm very well. Well, thanks for taking my call. You're most welcome. Go ahead. Uh, look, if there is one thing that I heard uh, because I watched it at uh, Federal Council on TV yeah. where the DA leader was claiming that there is a report from an international organization which says there is a smaller gap between the rich and poor in Cape Town. Hmm. Something which flabbergasted me and uh, very much surprised me because, you know, we've got informal settlements here uh, that are at greater risk from the effects of disasters. We see them on, on news, especially during winter time. Uh, uh, and you have people who are living a lifestyle which is almost equal to that of the European standards. Hmm. in the same city. Uh, So if your guest can be able to articulate to us listeners and convince us as to how, uh, you know, this report uh, or a survey was conducted to come up with such such a thing to say there is a small gap. Number two. Very briefly, Sanel, I really have got to move on. Yes. Uh, You know, the DA, of course, it does not have cadre de- uh, cadre deployment. It's true because uh, you cannot have cadre de- uh, deployment if you don't have cadres. Because a cadre is a nucleus of a trained personnel around which a larger organization can be built and trained, mm. or a tightly knit group of zealots who are active in advancing the interests of a revolutionary party. They are not a revolutionary party, so they cannot have cadres. All right, Sanel and They have friends mm-hmm. for the, uh, deployment, you know. And okay. uh, Jobs one repels. important thing, uh, 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 Colani, uh, lastly, is that the informal settlements in Cape Town have, uh, you know, are situated in wards where there are councillors. Those councillors have been barred by the deputy mayor in terms of administering proof of address. Sanel is in Cape Town. Thank you. Let's go to Mkondo Etwato. Hello. Nani. Yeah, Mkondo. Fine, man. Yeah. yeah first of all, I want to touch on the issue. I'm not sure whether it was a Congress or a council that was held in Boxback. But first, maybe it can't be a Congress because first you look at uh, the issue of the delegates. They are being appointed. They, there are no branches. There are no regions. They are being appointed by an individual in the highest position of the A. So first is that there is no democracy within the party itself. Also is that the DA is still a, a white a liberal party because blacks they are just there to, to vote only. Then we come to the issue of the Cape Town. The DA they cannot just claim that uh, they've got good governance in Cape Town. Look the issue of the trust in Cape Town. The issue of gangsterism in Cape Town is high. The issue of workers are not taken into consideration. The issue of the living standards of the Africans in the township, they're still living in poverty, in shacks. The issue of uh, employment equity, it only still favors the white people. 
You see, the issue okay. of the creature bull uh, procurement. Okay, Mkondo. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Dr. James? I mean, a number of issues have been raised. Let sure. me just uh, start off with the city of Cape Town. Yeah. When you talk about, I mean, it's an important question about inequality that was asked. But inequality is a measure between the least well-off and, and the best uh, in terms of rewards, you know, the highest paid people in, uh, in the area. And the gap between the poorest and the wealthiest in Cape Town is smaller than in other parts of the country when you look at cities, but it's a relative measure. So if you look at the absolute levels of, of poverty and poverty alleviation, just this one number I'd like to quote, mm -hmm. is that of the 18 billion rand spent in the city of Cape Town on direct service delivery, 11 billion is spent on the poor and poor areas. And so we, and a number of other figures also um, that I can mention is, so that the city of Cape Town in the spending of ratepayers' money is spending more money on poorer areas and wealthy areas. If you look at schooling, you can see that we focus on underperforming schools, especially in poorer areas and so on. So it's simply not the case that the DA is not working hard to make sure that the least well-off in, uh, in our city and in our province is getting the biggest proportion of resources. And I can demonstrate that factually mm. to you. That doesn't eliminate all the squatter settlements, especially when you dealing with the highest immigration in the country presently is into the Western Cape and into Gauteng. Uh, so you have, you have, you know, a growing population. Uh, and so there's a lot of pressure on the resources. Um, but I think we are doing well. We can do a lot better and we certainly will try very hard. There is an issue of the DA being a white liberal party, blacks there to vote only, internal democracy not working. I suppose it also go, oh, goes back yes. to the issue of uh, 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 just blacks and the role that they play within the party. Okay. I mean, we're getting a bit fixated on the race here. But let me just say that uh, we had 1,450 delegates to our Congress that could come. 1,250 came, actually came. They're all nominated by provinces. Not elected by the uh, leaders. They are, that's factually utterly incorrect. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at the at the the people who came as delegates, they are uh, representative across uh, uh, the the groups in the country. Mm. And so we anybody was there would have seen it. And if you look carefully uh, on the television footage, you can certainly see that we are a non-racial party. Uh, and that we are not, uh, we're simply not a white party. I mean, it's just factually incorrect. Mm. Uh, as for being liberal, we have, yes, we are committed to liberal values. We believe in the individual. We believe in individual achievement. We believe in education, therefore. And we think that in terms of the best of the liberal tradition, we certainly embrace that. Mm. We, but we're not simply liberals uh, because we also believe that there ought to be manners of social redress. All right, because, you know, and, and I would like us to just talk a little bit, if we may, and I know you, you're talking about the fixation with um, uh, race politics, but earlier on, Ralph was talking about the rapport with black constituencies and so on. Um, I, I just wonder why you think that there is uh, this perception that the DA is and continues to be a white party. Why do you think that is so? Uh, before you respond... Let, let me tell you what uh, Obrima Chipka said in his article yesterday. He said the DA needs to manage two challenges for it to become the ruling party of this country. First, it needs to deal with the damage that was caused by the success of the Fight Back campaign in 1999. Now, he says this campaign dislodged the new National Party as the official opposition, but defined the DA as a party of white interests, including those of a reactionary and conservative kind. Now, the point is, and this is why I read this, is that According to Aubrey, that's where he locates this um, uh, perception that the DA is the white party. Where do you locate it? Well, the history of the DA, I mean, goes back to the Progressive Party. It goes back to Helen Sisman. It goes back to the Liberal Party of the 1950s. And its evolution um, since then has resulted in one, what we have now, um, the Democratic Alliance. In 1994... Uh, our pre predecessor party got um, just over 1% of the vote. Uh, today, we have 25% of the vote. So we've grown from a 1% party, a 2% party, to 25% party, and we want to grow to 30% by 2014. So that's our evolution. We've come from a certain history, and it ought to be acknowledged, and it ought to be celebrated. I mean, there were fabulous individuals associated uh, with that history, including Helen Sussman as, as, as a key person. So what we must not see our history 
is as an excuse for something. It's something that's part of South African history. It's something that should be celebrated. But now we must look into the future. Uh, we are growing to become an alternative to the ANC. We want to become much more diverse, and we've committed ourselves to diversity. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the leadership and the people elected, you can see all manner of diversity, not just bean counting skin color, but looking at uh, assets that people bring to the party in celebration of our diversity. For mm -hmm. example, language use. For example, certain cultural practices and traditions. Uh, for example, uh, the fact that we are increasingly are, are seeing women take up leadership positions and women bring a certain quality to those positions in terms of their leadership style and so on. No, I hear that. But the point, again, by Aubrey is that mistakes, big mistakes have been made uh, within the contemporary South African politics, including in 1999, the fight back campaign that people still assume was more about fight blacks as opposed to fight back. I don't think it was a mistake. I mean, it might have been um, uh, presented in a ma I wasn't here at the time, but it might have been presented in a manner that was received as a mistake. But it was, in effect, an effort to, um, to, to say that what has to happen is that this majoritarianism on, on the part of the ANC has to be resisted, and it was fought with particular slogans. But now, you know, we moved far on. I mean, it's 13 years on, and we mustn't get stuck. We must understand history. We must take the good things from history. We must look at mistakes in the past, but now we have to really move on. We have to become a country of the future. We have mm. to look ahead. Mm. Uh, and the most important thing we need to focus our minds on is the fact that we have a country with a just over 30% unemployment. Sure. Um, and so we need to deal with jobs. And, and to deal with jobs, you need to deal with education. So let's, uh, the Western Cape's education system, mm -hmm. we've been really working very hard on it, and you can see uh, what the metric results do and so on and so forth. We're not perfect, but we think education is of, the fundam is of fundamental importance to get okay. right, quality education. All right. Uh, sorry, let me, I've got to read some emails here. Um, stay in Westville, for instance, says, DA will never transform in terms of their underlying policies or reasons for their existence, uh, which is driven pr uh, by protection of minority while claiming the most diverse party uh, with their window dressing of our misled brothers and sisters. That's stay in Westville. Uh, another one came through from Akosong um, Kalipi and Petri It's an email who says, why is the DA not, uh, not vocal on farm evictions taking place in Petri Tief and Bumalanga? Uh, what are the likes of uh, Anton Bernardi, DA MP leader, saying. Second question, has the DA ever trusted President Zuma's administration before and why the vote of no confidence now? Isn't the DA scared of the exodus of whites when black leaders are elected? It's the third question. Uh, perhaps we can just respond to these questions from Marco Sonke, if you may, Dr. James. Yes, I mean, starting with the last one, I think that um, we are a party that wants to uh, adhere to values and if we lose support because people don't agree with their values then we will lose support. We b don't believe that's happening. We're not shedding white voters because of the direction we're taking. So we want to make sure that we we solidify our support base and we grow and we, we have confidence that the people we take along with us are the ones who agree with our values. So I'm quite happy with that. Um, in terms of calling us our leadership window dressing, I mean, it's just not respectful, you know. I mean, we go through an election process. We are people of great quality, um, and uh, and and we we incorporate leaders with uh, with um, with rigor. And mm -hmm. and to call to call our black leaders, for example, or leaders with with darker skins, window dressing, I think, is just. Mm. disrespectful and it's not it, it's not uh it doesn't reflect reality and i won't be defensive about it i think that rather than dismiss the da because it doesn't meet certain racial criteria mm. um uh is to deny a part of our history and not to see uh what it is we have to offer okay. and to celebrate that all right i'm going to bring in ralph in a minute but this question is is coming up again da has failed farm workers in the western cape hence the duorans crisis but also it came through in this email where somebody said the da is not vocal on farm evictions taking place in petri Deef. do you find that there is a bit of a difficulty in 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 making pronouncements on these issues because you've got to please uh, to a certain extent the, the the farm owners and at the same time perhaps deal with the issues of farm workers do you find yourself uh, between a rock and a hard place so to speak no, no we don't I'm sorry uh, I think that it's um, the, the question of farm uh, labor conditions is a uh, is a national issue uh, the issue of setting minimum wages is a national issue 
the the question of uh, agricultural productivity and the creation of jobs is a national and a provincial issue. So when we speak about farm labor conditions in terms of wages that have been set, uh, that's the responsibility of the Department of Labor. Um, we are on, we don't govern the Department of Labor. It's a national department. So I think it's quite wrong to isolate the Western Cape. But what has happened is that problems have flared up, clearly. And those are problems that have to be attended to. Farm labor conditions vary enormously. If you look at the farmers that have been involved in the recent uh, uh, protest, then you'll see they're very specific farms. And they're very specific farms by virtue of a difficulty in um, being to difficulty they've been having in hiring foreign workers uh, given the xenophobic cycle of conflict in the past. So there's been some problems in the labor market. I think we've identified what the problems are and I think it ought to be addressed. And it's going to require yeah. national intervention firstly. The Minister of Labor should be present. The Minister of Agriculture should not go into the Western Cape okay. and, and, and cause more problems. So that's where the solution lies. And we have to work as a province together with the national, and we want to do that let me, to let sort me get, this out. Sure, let me get a last comment from Ralph. You know, uh, Colin, every time I, I listen to DA leaders speak, uh, uh, you know, particularly around the question of inequalities, it's, 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 it's disheartening because in a country where, uh, you know, it's disappointing in a sense because in a country where you have the spread of inequality al along racial lines, we have seen census results showing exactly how inequalities continue to spread and also the demonstration that uh, you are average black household and far less than a white household. These are the figures that are out there. But every time you put out these figures out to the DA, they deny that. They tell you that we shouldn't count the numbers and all that. We're going to come up with a totalizing policy. I've looked and I think this is maybe one of their main barriers to really grow mm. because uh, they fail to evolve beyond these technicalities that they always talk about and they, they, they've got a simplistic idea of what, what, what the South African voter is all about. And, you know, uh, um, if I looked at their policy, for example, their policy proposal or their response on affirmative action, they don't have a policy on affirmative action, to put it that way. It's quite thin if any, it's just a few pages that I've seen that they've put up on their website and all. And for them, they are always saying that, no, we are not going to count the numbers. We will try to come up with a totalizing policy will talk about growth it is very clear that in south africa growth does not solve the problem of inequalities what is it that the party is providing to deal with some of these challenges right. yeah. i don't find any response from sure. the da dr james uh, in wrapping up i mean that's simply not true the, the fact is we think that this country this country has the most unequal distribution of income in the world it is of the greatest concern and it's the greatest threat to our sustainability and growth the question is what do you do about that mm. um now our biggest challenge is poverty and unemployment, and the only way in which you can tackle that. Um, look, this is a national thing, and so it's under ANC government that we've seen this inequality in increasing. But let's say that we've done a careful assessment globally of what's going on in terms of growth. And those countries have grown, uh, like India, like China, like Brazil, like Argentina, like Ecuador, like Peru, like Turkey. Mm -hmm that are able to grow at some time, somewhere between 6 and 8% are able to halve poverty levels in a decade. Um, and the Treasury agrees with, with us on this assessment. The Finance Minister agrees with us, uh, Pravin Gordon, on the assessment. There's no disagreement with the ANC in terms of saying that what we need to do is get g growth going. The problem is that under the Zuma administration, you've got three economic policies, no agreement, in fighting and nobody is leading sure. in terms of right. uh, getting growth going in the Un country. Unfortunately, Dr. James, I, I'm really out of time and perhaps we should uh, in the near future again discuss these matters, the important matters. I really thank you both for your time this morning. Dr. Wilmot James, thanks Great indeed. Great pleasure. I much appreciate it. Dr. Wilmot James is the federal chairperson of the DA. Here with me in studio, Ralph Matecha, is always a pleasure. Thanks, Colin. Thank you very much. Thanks to the team. They put it all together for us this day and uh, we wish you a great day ahead. We'll be back again for you tomorrow, 6 to 9. Cheers from us. Nine 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 cheers.